my jaw just drops to the floor every time I see this chart and I've always wanted to understand it. How is it even in the realm of possibility that America could be such an outlier among advanced countries in terms of life expectancy and healthcare costs? And it's getting dramatically worse. While countries all over the world saw life expectancy rebound during the second year of the pandemic after the arrival of vaccines, the U.S. did not. So I decided to make an episode about it, but there were some things I could not answer. How is it that Asian Americans outlive white Americans by seven years? What? So I read health books by Chinese and Japanese nutrition professors and sought answers from Chinese medicine books, which read like nutrition books to me. I spoke to a very knowledgeable Asian American who provided tremendous insight, which I'll post later. But I couldn't answer how Australia outlives us by eight years. Don't they have many of the same problems aside from gun violence that we have? In Australia, we love our cities, but the cost of living in one is amongst the highest in the world. There's no worries if you're rich, of course, but it's hard yakker if you're not. And if you happen to be unemployed or on a pension, it's a daily struggle. Is it our healthcare system? So I met up with an emergency room doc who has practiced in both Australia and America. And that is what this interview is all about. I follow Dr. Coyce on Twitter because I'm so impressed with his grasp of the scientific literature. Well, it's great to meet you. you too. In person. How are you? How about that? In the flesh. Just, I love this spot. It's, it's, you know, the trees are so old and yeah. you know, the weather's great. I yeah. love it. You know, it's so nice to be talking to an emergency room physician who's not hovering over me with a grim look trying to save my life. Three of them have saved my life. That's why I'm here. That's why I have two younger kids, because an emergency room physician, and I never got to know them. I mean, they saved my life and then off I went into intensive care. What, what is it like to be an emergency room physician? Are you guys just adrenaline junkies? Take them to trial room two. What's your name, sir? I think that's certainly part of it. Part of what I really like about emergency medicine is we get to work in amazing teams that are high performance teams. I do get to see patients when they're at their most vulnerable. I get a lot of sense of satisfaction in helping those folks. It's interesting you mentioned that you know, the patients get whisked off to the emergency, to, to the intensive care unit pretty quickly. That's one of the downsides to the job is that you don't, as an emergency room doc, you don't necessarily get to see the whole patient journey. and. Yeah, our job really is to stabilize and then triage patients off to somewhere else um, where they can get the definitive management that they need. But you know, to be part of a patient journey, especially when they're so vulnerable and so sick, it's a pretty special thing, to be honest. How do you ever know if you got the diagnosis right? I mean, I, I can't imagine what you get presented with. Yeah. So, I mean, we typically do like eight to 12 hours worth of a shift, you know, so I'm there seeing patients, you know, anywhere from 16 to 24 patients in a shift. I spend a lot of time at home looking through charts and seeing what, you know, what patients ended up having. And oh, I see. Yeah, so it's a lot more than the time you spend in the hospital um, that you, you spend thinking about patients. And oftentimes patients kind of haunt your dreams sometimes oh, really? about whether you made the correct decision. Um, you know, and, and I think you all, we all develop different strategies in, in terms of how we uh, make our decisions to, to get the best outcomes for our patients. I guess it's a little like sports, you view the film afterwards. Exactly. So what happens when a patient presents themselves as having like severe abdominal pain, like I did when my appendix burst at age 27, and the doctors were saying, maybe they had less tools back then, but the doctors were saying, we're guessing, we're just gonna to have to open you up. Fortunately, we've got technology which has improved. And I know, Chris, you probably, you know, you were 27 then, so now that you're in your 30s, you know, 10. 30s, yeah. <laughs> late 30s. Technology's improved. We have a lot more data now, um, and there's lots of different des uh, clinical decision support tools out there, which one help us to um, make better decisions for patients, which is based on, okay, what sort of symptoms are related to certain diagnoses, which symptoms are worrisome that require more investigation or more invasive investigation. Things like CT scanners, you know, in the last 10 years have become much more sophisticated. We can see more of a patient giving less radiation. So the risks of doing a CT scan, for example, is a lot less. There's been this like really interesting, I guess you could say intersection of technological advancement with 
just sort of a wealth of data that have allowed us to make better decisions that can get patients good outcomes um, without exposing them to too much risk. Because obviously going in and opening someone up without knowing exactly what the diagnosis is, that's, that's a pretty invasive thing. So you're Australian? Yeah. You went to med school in Australia? Correct, yeah. And you practiced there for how long? I practiced there for five years after, five. after graduating from medical school, yeah. And then somehow you fell in love or something and came to Oregon? Correct. You know, as, as all good stories go, it involves a, a story of love. Uh, I met my wife over there. She was doing a, a study abroad experience, basically. Um, we met while I was in medical school and I had made an agreement that I would undertake some training in the U.S. So then we have flexibility between, you know, being able to work in both countries. You know, I guess the rest is history. We came to Portland and, you know, I was able to get a medical residency training position. And here we are. Somewhere along the way, you started your vegan journey yeah did she do that to you you know to be honest it was it's really interesting because it was something that I was always interested in and there's a number of reasons for that but we really only dove into it together and I think the re the fact that we did it together um, has made it successful and, and it was it's, it's been a cool journey it's also just really fun to just do that kind of thing with someone else what prompted it yeah, so a friend of mine who was living in the UK at the time, he had read the China study and he sent a copy of that book to all of his good friends. So I think there's like four or five of us that he had sent the book out to. And I was kind of just finishing medical school, you know, so I had a pretty good idea of what, you know, a healthy omnivorous diet looked like. He sent me this book and I read it and it was really thought provoking for those who've read it. You know, so then I started to think, oh, well, maybe I will try, you know, not having any animal foods in my diet. We kind of went back and forward a little bit. And, you know, I think if I had to describe myself at that time, I probably would have said I was a lacto over very vegetarian, you know, and then I guess once I sort of started down that journey, you start to think about other reasons and other pillars that, uh, you know, help you support decisions about what dietary choices you want to make. One was the health, uh, which was very important to me because we had our first child on the way and I wanted to, one, be around for as long as possible with my, with my children and my grandchildren, um, but also like be around and be healthy um, so that I can really truly experience you know my family for as long as possible you know and I think adding more plants to your diet in general is just an excellent way to achieve that. So then the next pillar I added on was the ethics piece and to be honest that was a very easy piece to add. Why does that so often come after you decide for health? It's really interesting I think as humans I think we have a real tendency for cognitive dissonance when it comes to our dietary choices. I don't I don't know why you know we all a lot of us have pets we all have dogs and you know my wife and I we talk about it a lot it's like why do we have this dog sleeping in bed with us um, and we treat it with such you know as royalty yet we don't afford the same uh, standards to say a cow or a pig you know who we are happily and sometimes uh, I guess not really cognizant that we're just we're destroying that life in order to to eat it having kids really helps solidify that thinking in my mind because you try to be as consistent as you can um, especially when you're helping your children to build an ethical framework that they can live their lives by and i wanted to be consistent you know with my kids and i felt that in making choices to eat sentient beings it wasn't really consistent with the value system that I want my family to have. But yeah, it is, you're right, it's an interesting phenomenon that, that we have. And I think once you open your eyes to that possibility and start to think about those processes a little bit more deeply, like it's actually a pretty easy pillar to, to put in place. And what about the planet? I see you talk on Twitter about the planet a lot. It's interesting, like here we are in Forest Park, which is an absolutely beautiful place. When we first moved to Portland in 2018, I used to run along these trails and I just had this one sort of watershed moment where I was running through the trails and I had these huge trees around me and you know I was hearing birds and stream and things like that. And I was thinking about my two young boys um, who were you know, toddlers at the time. And I thought, wouldn't it be really sad if they didn't get an opportunity to experience this? That then prompted me to think more and more about that and just the dietary choices that I make and how they um, impact on the environment and what are some simple things that I can do right now to try to help the environment. And I think dietary choices are things that we can make one, two, six times per day that can have a significant impact on the environment and our emissions. So, but beyond that, I, I think that my work in emergency medicine 
there needs to be a bigger focus on you know how the climate Im- impacts health that's kind of been another another journey that i'm that i'm trying to undertake you must see a lot of patients where you think oh if only their diet was different they wouldn't be in this situation yeah you know it's so it's so hard i in the emergency department i, I mentioned it already that we see people at their most vulnerable so it's kind of hard sometimes you feel like you want to take them aside and say hey listen you need to do this this and this and perhaps the environment isn't necessarily the most appropriate because they are vulnerable in that moment and they're sick and they need help and sometimes getting a dressing down isn't necessarily the, the the best thing but I think it's important to acknowledge and wherever possible I try to do it with patients because you know sometimes patients need multiple and people need multiple touch points of hearing the same information again and again before they are willing to accept and and make changes so mm-hmm. it's something that's really important um, and you know there's so many there's a variety of diseases and illness states which can be improved by diet specifically, but then also can be improved by systemic change and changing the environment that we live in, uh, which includes making a better climate and reducing emissions, reducing pollution, but also just changing our food environment as well to one that supports a dietary pattern that has been strongly associated with good health outcomes and longevity. So, so you have a couple of kids now? I have two, yes. And they're like four and two years old? They are six and five. Six and five. Coming up on seven and five. Wow. How are they reacting to a plant-based diet? Uh, You know, it's so, it's so interesting. We, yeah, my wife and I bang our heads together uh, quite a lot actually, because one day we'll make them this beautiful tomato soup and, you know, we'll put a block of tofu in there um, to make it creamier and they'll just eat it up and they'll give us you know thumbs up and they'll love it and then the next day they don't at all you know and it just doesn't make any sense to us but I think the bottom line is they are learning what it takes to eat a healthy diet Um, and I think as parents it's our responsibility to put good food good food in front of our kids and we don't push them uh, on you know you have to finish your plate all the way Um, we try to educate them about the choices that we're making as a family. So we're up front with them about, you know, well, they might say that a friend of theirs or another family member will say, you know, we'll be eating this steak or this this piece of animal food. And, you know, we're just very upfront with them about we've made a choice that we don't want to eat those foods. Um, and we give them the reasons. It's one, because we think that it's a healthier option. Two, we think that it's a better option for the environment. And three, we don't think that it's very kind to the animals. Ultimately, if they go somewhere you know, to a party and they eat some food that isn't vegan, we don't get worried about that. And I don't think that we should let perfection be the enemy of good. And who knows, maybe one day they, they choose not to, to eat this way. But what happens when they get a taste of ice cream? Yeah, I mean, the great news is there's excellent alternatives, you know. Like what? There's, oh, there's so, especially in Portland here, there's so many great options of vegan alternatives which are based on coconut milk or oat milk. You know, beyond that, we, we do lots of like berry smoothies and like nice cream, they call it, you know. So we'll wait till our bananas are nice and ripe and freeze them up and then we blend them and into a, you know, ice cream-like texture and the boys love that. Same with me. So we blend... We take frozen three berry blend from Costco and frozen bananas and soy milk. That's all it takes. Yeah. And you just put it in the Vitamix and make it smooth. And they just go crazy over it. So Rip Esselstyn was a firefighter. And he said, most of my calls as an emergency firefighter were for people who are having heart attacks. They weren't to put out fires. And that's how he ended up in advocating for a vegan diet and publishing his books and things like that. What are you seeing in the emergency room? Can you be more specific about what's diet related? Heart attacks, strokes, severe diabetes, severe obesity? Yeah, I mean, I think you touched on a lot of them. A lot of the social media debates, you know, get into high LDL and versus not high LDL. And, you know, when patients come into the emergency room, the person with a heart attack with an isolated high LDL isn't necessarily the, the, the patient that you see that often with heart attacks. Just thinking about heart attacks, for example, you know, most of the patients that come in, they have high blood pressure, they are overweight, they have prediabetes or they have diabetes. 
they may smoke as well and they have dyslipidemia as well. So the majority of these patients have sort of the full gamut of risk factors. It's just really sad to see because one of the things that I like to do as part of my patient care is to do point of care ultrasound. So basically every shift I'd probably scan five or six hearts. And when you're scanning someone's heart, particularly when you get really good at it, which I'm not saying that I am yet, but it can be, it can almost feel like you're holding their heart in your hand and you get a really good sense of what it's doing. And it's just really sad to me to see a heart that's not squeezing properly. Mm. And it's not squeezing properly because it's not getting a blood supply. You might see some some parts of the heart that aren't squeezing properly. You might see global dysfunction of the heart. And to think that a lot of that dysfunction can be prevented by different lifestyle choices is very disheartening. But then also part of me doesn't want to blame the patient either because particularly in you know places like America and Australia, we live in an environment where it's very challenging to actually, for some people to, to you know, make different choices with regard to their lifestyle. So how is it different in Australia? Why, <clears throat> whenever I see these lists of life expectancy, Australia is pretty high on that list. And the US is the lowest of the industrialized nations in terms of life expectancy and incidence of diabetes and all of that. What's the difference? I, I notice Australians seem to eat a lot of meat. Today we're doing a food tour of Australia. I have the kangaroo skewers. We're gonna try some surprising delicious meats. Mm. Oh my, hell yeah. Don't they? Yeah, they do, yeah. Yeah, I think, I remember, I actually remember a, a, a photo that I took from when I was a teenager of the barbecue and it was just full of meat. Oh, yeah. uh, you know, it certainly is a central part of, you know, most meals, you know, every Sunday it was a Sunday roast, you know, so come over for a Sunday roast. The old saying of, you know, let's have our steak and three veg, yeah. you know, so it certainly is. I think that probably the story with regard to life expectancy, particularly in the last few years, is probably more of a, a broader conversation than just the amount of meat and the dietary choices that Australians in particular make, but more of how the medical system runs. You know, I think we obviously have a universal healthcare system in Australia, um, which helps support people and helps people make different choices. And maybe we are able to keep, because of that, we're able to keep those risk factors at bay for a little bit longer. But if you then flip that on its head and say, well, what if they also didn't eat as much meat? What, what could then happen with the health of that population. You know, it's, it's an interesting dichotomy that uh, coming from Australia to the US um, and looking at what are the differences in the healthcare system and how you know, that affects patient care and patient outcomes. I was gonna say, isn't it a little bit of a shock for a doctor to come from universal healthcare to the US system? It is a shock, yeah, but I don't, I don't wanna beat up on it too much because I- Because you're a really nice guy. <laughs> I've well, always I'm seen here. that on Twitter too. I'm here now and I want to be, you know, I want to be part of the solution. Some things that are quite staggering to me is that the US as is, is essentially an outlier when it comes to healthcare in terms of expenditure of GBT, uh, GBD, no, GDP compared to other wealthy nations. It's certainly an outlier. Um, and then for that expenditure, the outcomes are not as good. Like neonatal mortality is higher, somewhere in the range of like two to three times as high as other wealthy countries. Maternal mortality um, in certain places, two to three times as higher in the US compared to wealthy countries. What are we getting for our money spent? And then another interesting point is when are we spending that money? Unfortunately, we're spending a lot of that money on the back end towards the end of people's lives when they've already accumulated all of these chronic diseases. Whereas a country like Australia or other countries that have universal health care, they're spending more money earlier on in life. That starts with even pre-pregnancy um, and during the pregnancy years. Um, what are we doing to help support our young families to get a successful start in life? And that you know, is partly dietary choices. I know, I know you always say, uh, you always quote the, what is it? Eat food, mostly plants, not too much. I, I can't think of a more perfect phrase to describe what a healthy human diet is, especially when you apply that to a population level. If everyone in a population ate that way, like the, our risk of chronic disease would go down significantly. And the earlier that we can start people on that journey, um, the better. Um, and that includes in the prenatal period. So, you know, pregnant moms who are eating in better ways, who are exercising regularly, who are not smoking, you know, who are getting out in nature and enjoying places like this. It's funny, there was a, there was a recent uh, paper in The Lancet that I, I 
I read this morning that talked about nature-based interventions and how they have excellent outcomes for, for health. One of the biggest differences I've noticed between, because the original question was, you know, what have I noticed that's different about America and Australia? With a system like Australia, we really value, or there's, there's a, the system is set up to value preventative health. When you turn 40, you go to your GP or your primary care provider, um, and you, you get basically this health screening and, you know, if anything's flagged like pre-diabetes or, or cholesterol, hypercholesterolemia, you know, you're, you're started on a, a lifestyle intervention that includes referral to, you know, your dietitian and all of the other networks, exercise physiologists to help um, you risk, reduce your risk um, of within those categories. Um, and it's funded by everyone that contributes to the system, which is everyone in the country. You know, and the difference here in the US is that you have all these siloed entities that have different ways of doing things, you know, because it's not universal, not everyone's putting money into that. It's difficult to, for some people to access that care, particularly if they don't have a job. Uh, so there's one glaring dif difference that, that I've noticed, and it, it's hard because it's a big system um, with a lot of people. You know, when you're training to become a physician, you, there's a lot of emphasis on learning the pathology and seeing more patients so that you can get better at your job to help more people. And it's hard to really dedicate the time to understanding how the system works and how the system can be improved. So yeah, there's, there's lots of things to, to uncover in that regard. And I think that it's gonna be something that is gonna be ongoing for many more years to come to try and you know, understand the, the issues and, and what are the valid solutions to try and get change. I do have to say that we, the training I've received in the US is excellent. I've um, heard that. It's really just supercharged my, my knowledge, I think. Not that I'd, I'm negative about the training I received in Australia. I think I also had very rigorous training there as well. But we, in the US, we train good docs. Primary care physician in the US has to spend 30% of their time filing claims or something like that yep. just to get treatment for their patients. And it's soul destroying when the, somebody in New York says, no, your patient can't have that. Where I, yeah, it's, I deal with that situation almost daily. I had two patients in one shift in the pediatric emergency department who the kid had a murmur less than two years of age and was waiting to get approval for an echo that their primary care provider had requested because clinically they needed it and they had to get approval from their insurance company to have that. So, you know, when a doctor is advocating for something that their patient needs and then for that to be at the the will of, a, of an insurance company to me is it's just it's something that's sad and I don't think it's necessarily the best way to help patients. So. And that doesn't happen to you in Australia? No not really yeah the system is it's totally different you know if you come in and the GP thinks that you need x study then you get the study done yeah maybe maybe it takes you can't get it like the same day and it might take a, a week or two weeks to get it done but you know by and large if the GP thinks that you need that test then you know you get the yeah. test so on the internet your professionals your doctors you've read the literature you see the patients every day but the internet is free for all and you've got a lot of trolls out there who are coming for you and saying you're in the pocket of big pharma and all that so what keeps you going on twitter and the internet when in the in that sea of trolls it's an amazing place the internet in general uh, social media is also an amazing place and it's also a double-edged sword because yes, you have those folks who you know, say things that blatantly are, are just hurtful and they're not informed, but then you also meet people who are incredible. You know, this relationship that we- That's why we're sitting here. Correct, yeah. you know. Um, there's so many people out there that I've, that I've learned a ton from. And then also just getting access to a different perspective. I always catch myself in situations where I think I you almost think you know it all, and then you hear one perspective that totally changes your mind and, and opens you up to a number of other possibilities. I mean, that's what, that's what I really like about it. Um, and then just getting to learn from people, you know. Um, there's so many people on there who are truly experts in their field and they have so much to offer and it makes it very accessible to the information that they have, which otherwise you wouldn't, you wouldn't get. You know, 10 years ago, you, before these things happened, it would, you'd have to go to, you have to enroll in a university degree and in, in, in a university course and sit in the lectures to be able to get access to that information. This is a challenge for people though, is like, who do they trust? You know, how do you discern like who is an expert and what advice is reasonable to, to trust? Because not everyone has 
the time or ability to sit down and read all the primary re- primary sources on things on a range of topics and and no one should be you know, and they're hard to read they are they're, they're very hard to read you know and and no one should be held to that standard that you know you have to be able to understand every single paper that you read on every single topic which is why i like guidelines so much you know i i rely on them heavily in my job on a day-to-day basis because and i'm okay with that because i know that A group of experts have sat down, they've read the literature, they've interpreted it, they are experts at interpreting that literature on that topic, and they're providing recommendations which are, you know, based on rigorous science. And sometimes it's not rigorous because we just don't have the data yet, and they're upfront about that, and you make decisions, you know, according to that degree of confidence. So there's a lot of work that individuals can do to try to improve their ability to recognize who are experts. Hopefully that will sort of cut through the trolls, so to speak. You know, I like to read what the trolls are saying. And I I like to read, there's other doctors who have completely different messages than the guidelines. And I like to understand them because they get so much traction online. Because their general message is, you can eat butter and be fine. You can eat all your favorite foods and be fine. Calories don't matter. Cholesterol's a hoax. Any doctor who thinks it's relevant is in the pocket of big pharma. I like to hear it because I like to hear what the general populace is exposed to. And those are simpler, more tempting messages than the messages that you have because you're quoting the New England Journal of Medicine. It's authoritative source and all that, but they go there and their eyes glaze over. Are you in the pocket of big pharma? (laughs) Yeah, no. It's, I don't know how else to answer that question other than say no. You know, I think that I, I, I understand where you're coming from when you, when you say you want to understand those perspectives. I, I also think that there is, it's important to listen to those perspectives as well. When someone comes into the emergency department and they talk to me about these things that they might have heard online, it can be related to anything. You can have better informed conversations. But yeah, it's, it's tiring sometimes. It can be exhausting. It, it is. It's very exhausting. And and the reality is, is that people who come in with these ideas that are, are very contrary to what the vast body of science says on a lot of different topics, they actually aren't that common. And there's a very noisy and vocal minority, I think, that drive a lot of this stuff and generate hype. One of the most popular doctors online, millions and millions of followers, has got his license suspended. But he pitches himself as a doctor and, you know, writes books and all that kind of stuff. He's immensely popular. But they have time for social media. They spend all their time on social media while you're in the emergency room trying to save patients. I mean, social media has become a, a viable income option yeah. for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, Some of them get rich. Yeah. So They buy houses and everything. Yeah, it's, it, 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 is, it is upsetting when people get bad advice. Oftentimes they don't know any better. Someone has to clean it up eventually. And unfortunately, when we catch people in the emergency department, it's usually on the worst day of their life. Yeah. I get the feeling that the diet book industry and the sort of conspiracy theories on the internet are dominated by Americans more so than Europeans or Australians or Canadians. Am I wrong in that perception or is that? I think you're pretty right in that perception. So uh, one of the things that has bothered me all my life is I started losing friends to heart attacks when they were 38. One guy when he was 38, another when he was 39, good friends. One guy was 43 and he died at the wheel of the car with his four kids in the back and his wife in the passenger seat. He slumped over the wheel, he had a stroke. His wife just grabbed the wheel and was able to negotiate successfully. Another one when he's 44 and then it really accelerates from there. When you get to be my age, you lose a lot of friends instantly and you don't get to talk to them afterwards and say, you know what, you might be able to reverse your heart disease, you know, if you just eat more plants. But instead, they're just gone in an instant. And they're young and think they're invincible and so on. You must see a lot of those in the emergency room. Yeah, there's, there's, I have a good collection of very sad stories. You know, and I'm, and I'm, still, I'm still early in my career. So um, unfortunately, I fear I'll probably collect a few more, which is why I'm like so passionate, I think, about going to places like Twitter and social media to because this is, this is how people consume information now, doing my part to amplify voices who do have excellent information. Sometimes emergency responders say they, they get PS, PTSD after 10 years or sooner because of all the things they see. Do you, is it that way in the emergency room too? Or? Uh, 100%, yeah. Oh, it is? Yeah, definitely. I, like one of the first times I think I ever did CPR was on a, a guy who had, who had heart failure. He had ischemic cardiomyopathy, which is essentially 
you know, low grade heart attacks where the blood vessels and supplying his heart muscle have just gradually, you know, deteriorated and his heart function has deteriorated as a result. And he came in and I mentioned ultrasound earlier. I was ultrasounding him to try to figure out exactly what was going on. And as I was ultrasounding him, he arrested and, oh, no. you know, I started to having have to do cardiac compressions on him. Um, and his daughter, who looked like she was in her 20s or 30s, was sitting in the room watching that. And that was the last time that she ever saw her father alive. Oh, boy. So I think about that case a lot, you know, and I think I had the imagery of his heart stuck in my brain and what it was doing with the ultrasound. And I think when you have that kind of imagery combined with the feeling of having to push on someone's chest to pump blood around their body, in combination of having the patient's daughter in the room, like how could you not be affected yeah. by that? The challenge that we have as providers um, of all kinds is how can we take those experiences into our into our being and work harder to prevent that from happening again to another family? Um, and that gentleman, I think, was like 57, 58 years old. You know, so young, young person. Well, that happened to me when I was 42 or so we thought. I went into the emergency room and I couldn't stand up. I was bent over because I couldn't see when I stood up. Then I fell back on my, um, on my butt when I got up to the, the register and I started throwing up and it was terrible. Somebody came out with a cart and said his blood pressure's 60 over 30 and they rushed me into the emergency room. I was there for six hours. And I think they thought I was unconscious a lot of the time because I wasn't responding, but I just couldn't see I don't know why I just didn't respond. I just, you know, they would ask me things and I would just lie there, you know, but I could hear, I could, I repeated back to them afterwards, you know, what they had been saying. Yeah. I don't know why I did that. And they thought it was cardiomyopathy. And it turns out it probably was hyponatremia or something. I never got a diagnosis, but I hadn't been eating much salt at all. And I do Ironman triathlons. I sweat in the heat and everything else. And my blood pressure had gradually declined over a year. Then it was 90 over 50, and then it was 80 over something. And, and eventually it got low enough. I was dizzy and nauseous in the shower, so I drove myself to the hospital. You know, they gave me a couple of IVs. That probably did more than anything. But six hours of them screaming, you know, and it was pretty dire. Yeah. So if I'd been out somewhere, I guess it would have been the end. I should interject here. After that experience, you can bet I studied electrolyte balance for endurance athletes. I learned a ton and never had another problem like that. Turns out sweat rate and sodium concentration in sweat are mostly genetic, and I'm high on both. I concluded that the dietary recommendations for salt are great for the vast majority of people, but very dangerous for idiot endurance junkies like me who don't eat processed salty food. I was three days in intensive care and another four days learning to walk in a straight line again. People said I looked like a pale ghost. The year I ran the 56-mile Comrades Marathon in South Africa in the heat, Two runners died from hyponatremia. And, uh, and I never got to know who the emergency room physicians were and thank them for everything they did. You know, 100 stitches in my eye when I got hit by a car and fractured my skull and everything. I was 10 hours in the emergency room then. So you guys must go through a lot of trauma, but you never get to see, you rarely get to see the patients who you saved, like me. It's gotta be hard. Yeah, it is hard. And, you know, I must say that it's not, we have, we have team, I mentioned it earlier, we have teams, high performance teams that we're a part of, which include nurses and x-ray technologists and, you know, emergency room technicians. We all band together and we kind of process those experiences together. But yeah, you're right, it's the, the patient connection is something that oftentimes is missing and, you know, a chart review after the fact is sometimes not always satisfying because, yeah. You'd like to know where they ended up and how how their lives are going now, you know. Sometimes people come in and they've got really well controlled risk factors, like their blood pressure is under control now that they've got medicines on board and their their cholesterol is under is under control now that they've got some medicines on board. But that doesn't necessarily take away all of their residual risk either. So, you know, which is then harps back to the idea Years of, of building up atherosclerosis. Correct, you know, and the importance of like having early interventions and preventative care, which start early in life. So, which then goes back to this systemic thing that we always talk about that, you know, we want people to live healthier and happier lives. And that starts by supporting young families and young people um, to make different choices that are better for their health. 
So what's my conclusion from this episode? It's that here in America, we do have great doctors and we have great emergency care, and we're really lucky to have them. We just don't have great prevention. The good news is, though, we do have two significant populations in the United States whose life expectancies are on a par with other rich nations. In my county here in Silicon Valley, the average lifespan is 85 years. How those two populations do it is simpler than you think, and the topic of my next episode. Part of me thinks that healthcare shouldn't necessarily be about profit. It should just be about I know. helping the patient you have in front of you. Um, Why is it part of you? Why is it not all of you? Because yeah, you're, I mean, you're I a say, nice guy. <laughs> I say you part want to of stay me. Positive. It probably is all of me. 